Welcome to the Self-Publishing School Podcast. This is the podcast to listen to if you're an aspiring writer or an author who wants to sell more books. On this show, you'll learn how to write and launch a book successfully, all from people just like you and from the most successful authors on the planet. I'm your host, Chandler Bolt, the founder of Self-Publishing School, the author of my new book called Published, and the CEO of selfpublishing.com. For free training on how to publish a book that sells 10,000 copies, go to selfpublishing.com forward slash Training. Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Mary Kay Eater. Uh, she's a retired U.S. Army Major General uh, and a renowned speaker and thought leader on strategic communications uh, and leadership. Um, she's the author of multiple books, including her book uh, "Leading the Narrative," her book "American Cyberspace," sorry, "Cyberscape," uh, and her most recent book, uh, "The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line." Uh, I'm really excited uh, for this interview, Mary. Great to have you here. How's it going? It's great to be here, Chandler. Thank you for. For inviting me. So why books? Why have they been such a big part of, of, of your career? Well, you know, for a while they weren't. I mean, I started out working in military public affairs, public relations. And so I've written lots of articles, uh, but I always wanted to write more, to write creatively and to write about things I care about. You know, I have an opinion, I have a voice and I want to use it. So I started putting different things together. My first two books were self-published, Stories in the Voice of My Dog, because he had stories he wanted to tell, obviously. And at the same time, I'm writing communications things about strategic communication, uh, misinformation, disinformation, three of those kind of books. And my first publisher had said to me, no, you can't have two of these and then one of those. And I said, why not? Then there's the poetry. So I really scared them with that. <laughs> <laughs> and so how did you get, I mean, did that, how did you end up getting past that to get your first traditional book deal? I didn't mention the earlier stuff. They could find it if they wanted to. Yeah, got it. <clears throat> That makes sense. And so, so trans, so kind of trans, so it sounds like a bunch of different types of books, books, um, stories from your dog, early poetry, and then kind of the military, uh, the mil military books, which it looks like, were those the first traditionally published? The first one was, um, yes, they were all of them are traditionally okay. published by different types of publishers, um, the Naval Institute press, defense press, um, and a academic kind of a press. Got it. Okay. Any lessons learned from, I mean, those are obviously very different publishing experiences between that self-publishing, like any lessons learned or, or, or things that might be helpful for people? Well, the great thing about self-publishing is you own it all. Now, the first couple of books, I didn't know much about layout and design. So I made the second book in the My Dog's Voice in a larger format and used color. So that priced it out of the market, which I didn't realize. So mm -hmm. there was a lesson in that, that mm -hmm. it got me better at organizing chapters, titling them, putting things together. Um, and, and when you introduced me, you said American Cyberscape Space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The publisher picked that title. Nobody mm -hmm. could pronounce it. Yeah. So yep. the good part about owning it is you pick the title you want, mm -hmm. but you also have to have, I think, an awareness of what's working. Yep. While I was writing the current book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, it was important to me from stories I found, but I didn't realize that World War II was becoming this big thing. Mm. So it's not that you try to game the market or hit a, hit a mark with what you're writing. You write what you want to talk about, what you mm -hmm. have things to say about and not mm -hmm. try to make them, I think, be popular. Mm -hmm. Some of that is accidental and, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what do you think, like, is it, do you feel like there's any skill sets? I mean, there's gotta be right. Like skill sets from your time in the military that helped you write and publish better books. My time in the military taught me to write expository writing reports, um, <clears throat> very nice emails and lots of them. <laughs> uh, I think it is a more bland type of writing. So if you want to go from that to writing conversation and fiction, it's very different. Mm. Plus, I also am used to writing Associated Press style guide. Mm -hmm. So the transition to back to the college days and using the Chicago Manual of Ta Style has been an adjustment, which apparently, according to my publisher, I have not yet mastered. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, because was it is the newest book, would you consider that more creative style than the previous books or no? Yes, because it's creative nonfiction. So mm -hmm. the stories are... Certainly my time in the military has helped me write the military parts of those stories in such a way that helps explain them better. Mm -hmm. Certainly some of those stories I found originally there were mistakes in them or people who wrote them didn't have a military background. So they skipped over or undervalued things that are significant. So mm -hmm. what I wanted to do was to do right by the people that I was writing about. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that was important to me and having mm -hmm. a military background made sure I got it right. The creative side was not in creating false 
conversations, but in making them interesting to a new generation so that they would want to read these stories. So that is the creative side to nonfiction and doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have fiction too. Yes, my agent is working on this. I'm selling it and I still have work to do on that. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask about that. I mean, what, uh, how do you feel like, or maybe what advantages do you feel like someone who comes from a military background has over someone who doesn't when it comes to writing either nonfiction books about war or military or even fiction, but like historical fiction, that sort of thing? Well, I think for me, because my background is in the strategy of communication, I tend to look beyond what's happening today. Other people are writing about what's happening. I want to write about what's coming over the horizon, what we need to worry about tomorrow, and what I see that's out there that you can find a lot of information on things, things to worry about next if you're, or pick any subject. And if you want to study it in depth, you can certainly see a trail, you can see a pattern, and you can see ways in which you might want to use that pattern or make your own story from it. So I've been doing that. Anything else that you feel like are just, and this is probably in some ways hard to articulate because it's like, it's it's subconscious knowledge, right? Uh, but is there anything else that you think about that's like, oh, because I have military experience, like you mentioned earlier, like some people would just skip over that whole thing, but you know, that's significant. Like anything else like that, that you feel like, especially for people who are listening or watching who are in the military, thinking about writing, whether it's nonfiction, historical fiction, that sort of thing that like might be helpful for them or a lens for them to look at, uh, to say, oh, okay, I can use, I can lean on this or use this to write a better book. Well, if you talk about the difference between say thrillers and mystery in a mystery, mm -hmm. the thing has already happened. And now we have to figure out who did it and mm -hmm. why. And the thriller is something bad did happen. And there's probably more on the way. So it's how do you deal with what you think is coming? How do you figure out what's happening and how do you stop it? So I think that's where I have that look ahead. So for example, I will look at a story about Russian presence in the Arctic because of the melting polar ice caps. So now I'm going to study climate change to see the effects. And then I'm going to do a what if, what if there is a conflict in the Arctic over rights to certain areas or passageways. And then that becomes my story. Got it. So there, there's the plot of my next book. Yeah, cool. Nice. Now what, uh, how do you navigate like what you can and cannot share in your book? I, I, I think I talked about this, maybe it was Leif Babin, co-author of Extreme Ownership. And I feel like other people that we've had write books with us that are in the military, they're like, oh man, I'm like, I'm gonna have to get approval to talk about some of this stuff. Some of this stuff, I don't know if I can talk about it or not. Like any, <clears throat> any thoughts or tips on kind of how, how to navigate that? My office and the chief of public affairs for the army did those approvals. Got so it. I'm pretty well versed in what you look at, what you don't want to give away. And everything mm -hmm. I use is open source. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything beyond open source, it's I create it. It's not based on anything that's classified or generally not known. Got so, it. so if I'm asked, I can say, I made that up. Got it. You know, there might be an accident at some point where you make up something that eventually comes true. Mm -hmm. um, certainly that happened in my current book, The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, where someone predicted a large bad event. And the next day the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And then she was questioned. So how did you know that? Uh -oh. And it was, oh, I didn't. I just, I just made that up. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's wild. And so that's interesting. You said your office handles those submissions. So any thoughts like from, I guess, the other side of the table for authors uh, in the military who are submitting, like what makes that process easier for them, easier uh, for, for the office, for your guys' office? Like what, what's, and what does that process look like? If you have some information that you doubt where it came from, do I remember this from when I was still in active service? Mm -hmm. Or did I read this somewhere that was classified? If you have any doubts about it, don't use it. Or if you feel like you could be giving away what we call TTP, tactics, techniques, procedures to perhaps someone with nefarious intent or, or a potential enemy of the US, then you wouldn't use it. So if you feel like you're giving things away, don't do that. You can refer to them obliquely. You can refer to them in a way that gives uh, some mystery to it and intrigue, but you don't have to tell exactly how things are done. Got it. That makes sense. Um, any, um, this is something I wanted to get your take on, and I guess kind of, kind of relates to uh, the topic of your new book as well. I feel like, and maybe this is just anecdotal and maybe this is just because I'm a guy, um, but I feel like you don't see a lot of books from women in the military. Do you agree? If so, why do you think that is? I don't, I do see some now. I see more mm -hmm. than in previous years. Um, some of them are helpful how-to leadership books. Certainly at one point, I thought everybody who retired wrote a leadership book um, <laughs> because there is certainly much to learn from everybody who's had that experience. But I, I do think that for many people who have left military service, they want to go on and do the next thing mm. and not write about the past. Oh, interesting. Or, yeah. Or what I went through, unless it's a, a, a autobiography. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know, I, I used to think I didn't read autobiographies until I looked at my
my bookshelf one day and there was a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think many people may believe, well, who would read this story about what I went through? So many others went through the whole, the same thing. Oh, interesting. Many people have the same experience as I did. Why would I write? And people ask me all the time, why don't you write your story? Because I don't think it's that interesting or because I think it's very common in so many ways. So why would I? I mean, I'd buy the first 500 copies and that would be it. Now, do you think that's true? I don't know, but I'm not going to think find other it. people would think that because I, I mean, do you know. find yourself buying books from people who are like, oh yeah, they had a similar experience to me. And that's actually maybe why I'm, in, why I'm interested. Well, that's true. And then I read it and go, ha, I would have done this differently. <laughs> You're a little judgmental, right? <laughs> that's funny. I hope you're loving this episode so far. So if you're serious about writing and publishing your book, we would love to chat with you and help create a custom plan. All right, so all you need to do right now is go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule. Schedule a 45 minute consultation with one of the experts on my team. All right, let's implement what you're learning in this episode and let's see how we can help with your book. Go to selfpublishing.com forward slash schedule. So I just, I guess I, as an outsider, you know, I've obviously never been in the military. Um, but it feels like there's this massive void of books from women in the military and that 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 would that would lead to okay <laughs> writing that like any other thoughts on that or maybe even even encouragement to the, to women in the military who are thinking about writing a book I would say go right ahead and do it now now we were talked about let's say Ashley's war is a book about a woman who was in one of the first female contact teams in Iraq or maybe it was Afghanistan but it, it's a a great story the rights to it have been bought for a movie that hasn't been made yet but those are the kind of stories that are the new unique. If we go back to the previous generations, while I was writing this book, I found some autobiographies of women who served in World War II. Probably I've read about 10 of them now. So they're out there, or actually they were out there in the 19, late 1940s, 50s. And so while I'm buying them online from eBay and they cost four and five bucks each, and in the front of them, it usually says property of the Sioux City, Iowa library or whatever place gave them up. So we cycle through generations of books. So that was a good thing though, because when you do research, if I had depended on an, a very long obituary, I read about a woman who was a counterintelligence agent. There were so many errors in that, but I was able to go back to find original documents, original biography, one written by an ambassador in 1948 that gave, this is exactly what happened as it was yesterday. So when you go back to the original documents, you get reality of what people thought and what they felt that. And not 40 and 50 later, when, years later when, well, you know, I want to protect my image here. And they change it. Mm, oh, interesting. Or they don't remember, yeah. you know, and it gets better over time. <laughs> Revisionist history, the, the the story that gets better as it gets old. Talk to me about uh, your most recent book. Um, so The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line, um, Untold Stories of the Women Who Changed the Course of World War II. Uh, just, you know, just looking on Amazon, it seems like this is by far uh, the most successful book that you've done. Mm -hmm. it, it, maybe that's, <clears throat> so is, is that true? And if so, wh why do you think so? Like, why do you think that book's done so well? Well, I think books on communication have a audience of communicators or or leaders who want to understand mm -hmm. communications because mm -hmm. leaders and executives have a built-in requirement to be good communicators and many need to work on those skills. I think the dog books have a have a kid kind of a audience. Mm -hmm. So I think this book has a broader appeal because it has 15 unique and diverse stories in it. Mm -hmm. So it appeals to a broad range of people who are from those communities who mm -hmm. or who understand them. Oh, interesting. Interesting. When it's almost like broad and specific at the same time. It is, but they're not all military either, because Got I it. think it would be more limited if it was. Mm -hmm. So there are women who fought in the resistance. You know, they're mm -hmm. 17, 18 years old and, hey, I'm going to do this, take the risk, take a chance, but they don't know exactly where it will go. So there are life lessons in it. So the job itself doesn't really matter in some cases. I think that for one of the women in the book is a nurse. So for example, people think nurses had it easy. They did not. So she was on the front lines, earned five battle stars going from the beaches of Normandy all the way through the end of the war. And these nurses had to put up the tents for the field hospital every 10 days. And so when you read about this and in, in stories about her, it goes, and then they put up the tent. If you have ever put up one of those tent, tents, it takes at least 10 to 12 people to do it. And it is not easy. So they're doing it in the rain while they're being shelled, while they're bringing in wounded and doing it every 10 days. So that one line did not cover what that experience was. Mm, got it. And so that's where you that's where you felt like there was either probably a little bit of both personal interest and this part, this untold story that, all right, I want to dig a layer deeper. Yeah. And, it, and it, there's this void in the marketplace where people aren't talking about these things. Right, right. <clears throat> and it's also the greatest generation. Oh, no, I didn't do that much. I just did my part. I don't need to, I, no, I don't need a medal. I don't need to talk about it. Everybody did something and that was just my 
my way. Yeah. So it, the, the modesty of it all also decries, I think, the actual accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Now, do you, do you feel like, I mean, I know it's hard to know some of this data, but you feel like, is it predominantly women that are buying this book? Women and men, predominantly men? It's women and men. It's, mm-hmm. it's women and men. Sometimes military men are buying it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Lots of people are buying it for their kids. Mm-hmm. I don't see oh, that the Gen Z is buying it as much as older millennials. Mm-hmm. Got it. I, that Because that's just one of the things that strikes me. Because when I was looking at, at your different books and I was like, man, this is very interesting. Like, just that it seems like this book is doing so well. I I felt like, honest, on, I'm like, oh, I feel like women in the military would love it. And so it's just like, so like on, I feel like on the nose for that, that group of people that it's like, oh, that's probably part of why it's selling so much better. You feel like, is there anything that you did differently with this book than the other books that's, that's caused it to sell so well? Like in the market? Mm-hmm. I think the beginning part of it is the military audience, but it has expanded far beyond that. So uh, libraries, I think carrying it and promoting it has also been helped. So there's also the reviews. There are not reviews of my book in most military publications because it's not about battles and generals. This is about ordinary people at all levels. And I think until we have the stories of ordinary people from all walks of life during a period such as a world war, <clears throat> we don't have the full picture of what happens. Everybody who was alive at that time was involved in one way or another. I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at your Amazon uh, description here and interesting the, like the specificity of the marketing is for fans of Radium Girls and history and World War II buffs. Uh, and then it kind of goes into it. So it's like, I love how it just, you instantly understand what the book's about and whether or not it's for me. <coughs> what, do you feel like, was that, was that intentional and different from kind of what you've done with some of the other books or no? This is what the publisher does when they, when they post it for Amazon mm-hmm. and for other sites for how they do their descriptions. I'm probably not as flamboyant with how I would describe. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. What um what's the biggest difference in the in the writing style? And and any any lessons learned from there that might be helpful for people in the writing style from writing this book to um, your experience writing some of your other books? I think that when I am writing conversation, the way I write conversation is to just let it flow. Mm-hmm. I can't do it and put in all of the quote marks and the punctuation and that annoys me. I have to mm-hmm. go back and do it later. So if I want it to sound like a conversation, I have to write it like one and then come back and fix it grammatically to be correct. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And that's something that we recommend for a lot of authors. It's even just right, when you're when you're writing, don't edit while you write. <laughs> right. It's it's because we all know someone who has five perfectly written chapters in their unfinished book. Yes. And if you spend yeah. the whole time editing, it's like you just keep editing the same stuff. And so even sometimes uh, I know two things that a lot of our authors do is our big red text text for like, okay, I need to add a story here. I need to add an antidote here or that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Or um, I think this is a Tim Ferriss thing, but uh, TK and using that, uh, those two letters in your writing, is kind of a, it's a marker where I need to go back and add or fix something here because mm-hmm. it's, you know, uh, pretty much never used in the English language. So that combo of letters, you can easily search and find in your, in your, man, in your manuscript and, and go back to those places mm-hmm. and make it. <clears throat> well, let, let me tell you about when I wrote this book, mm-hmm. because I signed the contract to write it in January of 2020. Mm-hmm. They wanted the completed manuscript by 1 May. I had written not then. We have the pandemic begins and every site I would go to for research shuts down. I can't contact museums, libraries. I can't oh, go anywhere. So yeah. that's when I started buying books online, which um, was done in a sheer panic for the most part, but it took me back to those beginning sources and it was good. So I wrote that book in two months. I think it should take you 18 months to write a book that's um, researched like that. <clears throat> but I didn't have much of a choice at the time. So my going back now is in doing a newsletter um, from my website so I can tell more of the stories I found. I can now go to sites I couldn't. I could see a video about one of the people in the book where they did an interview mm-hmm. that told me things I had never been able to find. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm able to do updates. So will there be another edition? Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. How, how did you uh, how'd you write the book in two, in two months and any any lessons that you learned from that process? It was what you had just said. Just keep going, mm-hmm. get, it, get it all done and then go back and look at how it goes together. And it didn't go together. They, the publisher liked the chapters in a different order. So they reordered the chapters and then I had to make them flow, Mm -hmm. make a transition from one to the next that made sense. Mm -hmm. Some of that was easy enough because many of these people were connected in odd ways that you wouldn't expect. Mm -hmm. They knew of each other or they'd been in the same place at a different time, or they'd heard of what the other one did, or they had similar boyfriends who were pilots, you know, all kinds of connections in ways that helped it flow together. 
makes sense. You, I don't know if you, if you, if you, if you knew this or noticed this, but I'm looking at your book on Amazon and, and um, the girls who stepped out of line is one of the editor's picks yes. on uh, Amazon. Is that, yeah. did, what, did they, did they reach out about that? Did that just happen one day? Like how did that process work? <clears throat> I think because they received an, an ARC, an advanced reader copy, mm -hmm. they, by the time it was posted on their site for the launch date, it was already an editor's pick. Oh, no way. So, and it was for the Washington Post for the month of August and, and a couple of other places, uh, Library Journal and a few others. Wow. And that was your publisher that did that or how'd that happen? Um, as far as I know, it was magic. So <laughs> you know, it, was, it was the publisher, but I don't know how they do that. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. That's really cool. Like you don't see that often on books on Amazon. That's um, well, uh, Mary, what would be uh, your parting piece of advice uh, for the Mary from years ago where you wrote your first book, or maybe even for people who are uh, listening or watching who are in the military, thinking about writing a book? Uh, yeah. Well, knowing what you know now, what would kind of be your, your parting piece of advice? You can do this. Do not be dismayed by the fact that it needs to be 80,000 words. <clears throat> Make yourself an outline, do the first chapter, then write the third one. And then you can see that you can do this one, one piece at a time and you assemble it later. So it's the bite out of an elephant kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about how large it is. Sooner or later, you'll break the computer with it because it's <laughs> that big, but you can do it and you can get this come together and be reasonable. Tons of other people are doing it. You can do it too. That's awesome. Well, Mary, this has been great. Where can people go to buy the book uh, to find out more about you and, and what you're up to? Well, the book is on, of course, on Amazon since you're there with it and Barnes and Noble and any other places that sell books. Although we love independent bookstores for sure. And, <clears throat> and libraries have it too. Some of them have more than a few copies, which I think is great. So what else did you ask me about what's next or? Yeah. Well, where, where can people go to find out more about you and what you're up to? Oh, I have a website. They made me have a website. You need to have a website so that your people who are interested in what you write can continue to keep up with you. The same with having a newsletter. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do a newsletter because it's more work. Mm -hmm. But then I found that it let me tell more of the stories that I was still finding. I liked it. Mm -hmm. So my, my website is, well, the name of my dog was Benson. So it's bensonsreview.com or it's just my name, Mary Kay Eater. Cool. Awesome. Uh, well, the new book is The Girls Who Stepped Out of Line. Uh, ch uh, check it out. Grab a copy. Mary, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been great. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Self-Publishing School Podcast. I know there's so many places that you could be spending your time. There's other podcasts that you could be listening to, YouTube channels that you'd be watching. So thank you so much. It means the world. Now, I want you to do three things right now if you found this episode helpful. I don't know if you know this, but we've got a YouTube channel. It's a companion channel to this podcast. All the video versions of the episode are on the YouTube channel. So number one, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Number two, if you're listening to this podcast wherever, whether this is Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Number two, I want you to subscribe to this podcast right now so you don't miss a future episode. And then number three, this is probably the most important, leave a review on the podcast. All right, reviews are super important and help this podcast get discovered by other people. So number three, leave a review on the podcast. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next episode.